Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I say that to remind myself that the only reason I have to be up in front of you is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Amen. Uh, that's, that's the only reason. Uh, I woke up at 3 a.m. with three stories in mind. I was not anticipating this. You know what? We're three weeks away from Easter, and I remembered in the late 80s at uh, Scarborough Baptist Church in Toronto, uh, east of the beaches, um, all gentrified now, but it wasn't then. And I was teaching full time in a seminary, uh, was then Ontario Theological Seminary, now it's Tyndale Seminary. And, uh, and teaching there required a lot more of me than teaching at Beeson. Uh, large classes, multiple classes, just a lot of work. And I was pastoring a small urban church with about 10% of the church from the Azores, Portuguese speaking, another 10% from the West Indies. And uh, it was a really challenging church, but a great church for me to work in. Um, it took me several years to get over my PhD, and this church helped me do that because they couldn't give a rip that I had a PhD. Um, they didn't kind of even think or speculate about what that was about. Uh, and they also thought I was their full-time pastor, even though I was a full-time teacher. And we had three young kids, um, and our youngest, just a baby, wasn't sleeping through, and it was Easter. And I remember getting up, and I said, probably a lot like this, Christ the Lord is risen. Christ the Lord is risen. I was exhausted, totally wiped out, and uh, both my wife and I, uh, that actually led to kind of changing aspects of my life because obviously I wasn't doing justice to the risen Lord. I was just too tired and doing too much. Between me and the seminary were 26 traffic lights coming and going. And that was with two miles on expressway. And it just, I, you know, um, and it actually led to the change of us coming back to the States and pastoring <coughs> ECC. So then in the 90s, I remembered Easter. We, uh, these are all sort of sad stories. Um, <laughs> I remembered uh, as a we're Evangelical Community Church, which is now Christ Community Church. They got rid of the evangelical because of the political situation in an, a university town. Uh, changed nothing of their theology or their mission. But on Easter, we would rent an auditorium at IU, Indiana University, that would seat like 3,000. We wanted our multiple services all to come together on Easter and we wanted an outreach in the community, and this church had one. Uh, and uh, I was preaching on Acts 17, Paul's address to the Athenians. And, uh, you know, he's, he's contemplating their idolatry and their distant, their inability to kind of hear about the risen Christ. And we kind of had the idea that we would show a lot of the idols of our culture on the stage. And I dressed in a white lab coat to make the point that this too is true. And it went okay. I enjoyed the message, and I look back without regret on the message, but I look back to and thought, you know, we tried too hard. We didn't let the gospel just do the message. We tried to sort of contextualize or create something. Um, and what I remember about that was how gracious the older people in our congregation were to me. 
whereas they could have been pretty provoked and, and write me, written me off, but they didn't. Um, and then at First Presbyterian Church in the early 2000s, uh, we had been preaching through Revelation all through Lent. And we were coming to the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, and, and we had moved my mother. My mo Dad died at 49, and she sort of moved with us. We brought her to each of these churches. We moved her from Wheaton to, from Buffalo to Wheaton, from Wheaton to Bloomington, from Bloomington to Denver, from Denver to San Diego. Always two moves, finding another place uh, for her. Uh, and she was dying, and I was finishing Revelation. And, uh, you know, Revelation has its own intensity and its own passion. But on the family side, I had this passion going on as well. And uh, uh, I remember a pastor friend. I was in a covenant group with tall, steepled pastors. I had the smallest church. And uh, he visited us on Easter Sunday. And uh, I remember his remarks about the church and the message as being so deeply encouraging at a time when everything seemed to be max on a personal level and on a church level. I really love preaching. Uh, it is, you know, um, we have a friend who calls it the joyous burden, and it definitely is that. Um, and yet, it's the kind of thing that, uh, and this is one of the concerns I had leaving the church to come to Beeson, was that um, with that aspect of my life, not have the same sense of vitality. And I have to, I mean, it, this is a good job to grow old in, even if you're abandoned by all your friends. Um, <laughs> this is a good job to grow old in. Uh, but I, I don't, I, you may not feel it right now, but the opportunity for you to proclaim God's word week in and week out, there's really nothing better than that. That's right. That's right. As, as challenging and as hard and as difficult and as at times frustrating, um, it's, it's a wonderful calling to have. This is the verse that has uh, inspired me through the years. Um, it has at times been the church mission statement from Colossians 1.28. And I hope you all have this. We'll follow along. If someone doesn't, please raise their hand. We proclaim him. Now that's from one version of the NIV. Uh, your version, uh, it would probably be him we proclaim. We don't talk that way, so I imagine that's why they translated, we proclaim him, because we don't, we don't speak in terms of him we proclaim. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. It's almost like every word in this, uh, these sentences is important. We, uh, we. Uh, Calvin, you know, and I'm a Presbyterian, so what I'm saying, I'm, I'm a sort of in a Calvin camp, but he kind of thought that Paul was just sort of using a kind of royal we, meaning me, meaning the preacher. But I don't think so. I think Paul really meant we. Every man, woman, and child in Christ proclaiming. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We. We proclaim. Uh, Dr. Tennant was uh, here last week, the president of Asbury Seminary, and uh, he made this 
line out of G.K. Chesterton that all the rel religions can be taught, but only Christianity can be proclaimed. I'd like to find that quote in Chesterton. I looked, but I couldn't find it. If you come across it, um, we proclaim Christ. And then the work of the pastor theologian, the work of the preaching pastor, the pastor who preaches, admonishing and teaching everyone. Now, you see the inclusiveness of Paul's statement of mission and ministry and preaching, everyone with all wisdom so that we might present everyone fully mature, that the fullness of this, the allness of it all, but proclaiming, admonishing, and teaching seems to cover every medium by which we would communicate the gospel. Uh, that's a slow work. You know, in the Great Commission, when Jesus says to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, that's a slow work. It's not a fast work. It's not an overnight job. Proclaiming, admonishing, and teaching. It's as if Paul is going to, I'm going to cover all the mediums of communication that I can think of with all wisdom. When we left uh, First Press San Diego, now 16 years ago, it's hard to believe, we had spent 14 years there, and it seemed like it was the right time Church was going really well. You don't want to leave a church when it's in the middle of something. Um, all my kids had grown up there. They'd all gotten married. It was just the right time, it seemed, to enter a new phase. And uh, Timothy George had come to First Press for a meeting in San Diego. And that day, I had happened to be preaching on the Trinity. Timothy likes the Trinity a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing led to another, to the invitation to apply. And, uh, but now, 16 years here, and we, uh, an artist in our congregation who was multi-talented spiritually, as well as artistically, spiritually, artistically, as well as relationally, uh, she's now in her 90s, but she had done a picture of the church and then a calligraphy of this verse. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone. It hangs in my study here, but she left out one word. Uh, I guess if you're an exegete type or a nerdy theologian, that, that kind of gets you. Left a word out. You know what word she left out? All wisdom. All. Left that out. You know, it reads really well without the all. Uh, and, you know, I, this probably says something negative about my personality, but I, I put the picture in my closet <laughs> for a couple years. And then I looked at it and I thought, ah, I'm going to put it up. Now, every time I see it, what do I see? The all, all wisdom, by her not having it in, has put it in, uh, in a more dramatic way. Uh, I guess that's the Spirit of God working. I, you know, this, uh, this, line, this mission statement sort of judges me, because to be frank, to be honest, that we may present everyone Everyone fully mature in Christ? How many people do we write off on a Sunday morning? That they're in the category of, oh, no way are they going to change. Everyone mature in Christ. <laughs> giving up on no one. And to this I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Uh, I'm looking at this box, Scripture to Sermon, 10 Steps. Uh, 
Number one, remember that sermon prep is a way of life, not a job description. It is a, you know, preaching is an act of immersion in the Word of God and in the life of the people. Uh, my first job uh, in a church was a janitor. I was in high school. Uh, the church was empty through the week for the most part during the daylight hours. Um, but they wanted me there by the hour. Uh, I don't think I've ever worked on a job by the hour since that time. Because, um, I mean, how much lemon pledge can you wipe on the pews, and how many floors can you clean, and that type of thing. But I liked the pastor. The pastor seemed to like me. And one day he invited me into his study to look at his locked file cabinet of his 150 sermons. And I took it more not as a boast, but as a statement of fact, that he had a sermon for every occasion. Uh, these sermonic talks, sort of generic illustrations, generic jokes, generic anecdotes embedded in the text, like he's got it, got all the work done. Uh, I have kind of rebelled against the sermonic talk. That you've got a kind of packaged deal here and you pull it out and you can use it at the right time. To me, every occasion to preach is kind of a fresh and new occasion to preach. Uh, and even though I, and I'm thankful I do, preach over and over and over the same text, I find myself not helped a great deal by just going back to the old sermon. Um, if I go back to the old sermon, I usually regret the fact that I preached so poorly back then. Uh, it's, it's somehow, you know, the Holy Spirit works. I, and, you know, I would follow Lloyd-Jones here. I do think that there's something very unique within the moment of the Holy Spirit working within the congregation through the Word that you cannot replicate by tape or even streaming. Uh, we are meant to be together. All of that with the idea that yeah, it's a way of life. Uh, to read the passage, pray the passage, reread the passage. <laughs> um, Dr. Smith, what do you say? 50 times? You have minimum. minimum. Uh, you don't need to know Greek and Hebrew to exegete a passage. I think it's great if you do. But just understanding how language works, and understanding what is being said, and feeling the text, as well as interpreting the text. Number three, give yourself time and space to think and pray over the passage without books. I'm going to fly now a little bit. Four, study the passage in its literary, linguistic, and cultural context. Five, put your ideas down on paper, outline, or manuscript the sermon. For all these years, I pretty much write out my sermons. Yeah, procedurally, I write out my sermon. Uh, I do like writing. I process through writing, uh, process life through writing. Uh, I have found here, like this semester, I haven't had a lot of opportunity time-wise to write just because of the busyness of this past semester with many things, with church as well. Um, that I find in a text with a morning to write, actually vacation. It's restful. It's peaceful for me. Um, but then on Sunday, after having gone over this manuscript multiple, multiple times, uh, I find myself hardly looking at the text I mean, I just, it's, 
put aside. But and over the years, always writing, trying to express it, thinking about how to transition from this idea to the next, uh, understanding how other pastors transition so effectively. Uh, it's just, it becomes also part of you, part of what you are expressing from the Word. Uh, it has an accumulative, thankfully, an accumulative sort of impact um, as you hone in on Scripture like that. I do, uh, these are some of my personal opinions that are wedged in here too. Um, I'm about a 20 minute sermon now, I'm shorter. Um, uh, California was great preparation, um, I think. Um, I'd rather 20 minutes where I feel like I'm still keeping people, where I'm really directly in conversation with them and have invited them into the conversation on this truth, rather than conveying a certain amount of information that I feel they ought to have. Um, now, I have, I have class time to do that, um, but I don't see the opportunity to do that in the pulpit. I also see, you know, in church we have class time in a way that allows greater freedom. Number seven, preach first to yourself and discuss the sermon with wise and discerning friends. I think in, at some point there was a idea that pastors go into their closet and the Spirit speaks to them and then they burst forth with the unction of the Spirit on the congregation. I'm not knocking that, it just hasn't worked for me. I'm in dialogue over my sermon all the time. Uh, my kids have been good listening, interacting with ideas. Not as a sermonic talk. They would reject that really quickly, but over an idea. And I think that they feel even respected. This was back when they were teenagers and college students. Um, now they're preaching. Um, but I do think I, and in preaching class, I want my students to have talked the sermon over with two or three people before they preach it. Seek out wise counselors, good friends. Uh, I'd like, I like it. I, I'm always feeling great when spouses um, have engaged with either their husband or their wife over the meaning of the sermon. Uh, Number eight, serve the listener. Never assume you're preaching to a captive audience. You, you, can you sense sometimes when people feel like, well, I've got you here? I never want to give that kind of impression to people. I got you for these 40 minutes, um, and I'm going to use those 40 minutes. Uh, Number nine, remain open to the Spirit's wisdom in developing the sermon even after you've preached it. <laughs> the editor <laughs> for this book, when he saw number nine, <laughs> said, how neurotic are you? That you're still thinking about the sermon after you delivered it. I rewrite sermons on Monday because of the interaction within the body. And I have under, you know, I understand things better. In San Diego, we had two services with Sunday school in between. And often I would go to Starbucks and pick people that had been in the first service, the eight o'clock service, a range of people from elders to teenagers, one or two. And I would tell them, I need you to go and talk about the sermon, what you heard, what you didn't understand. Uh, my middle son has probably been the most <clears throat> uh, non-church-oriented. Non um, always would come to church, though. Came to church always without complaint. I'd give him a red pen and $5 and tell him to circle every word in this sermon that doesn't make sense to you. And he, with relish, <laughs> did that. Uh, now, 
obviously I wasn't just interested in the red pen or the words of correction. It was also a way to engage uh, him. Um, and he probably saw that, saw through that as well. Number 10, end every sermon with a focus on what Christ has done for us. Uh, that's where it gets really simple if your sermon ends at the Eucharistic table at Holy Communion. To me, uh, text to sermon, sermon to table is kind of the natural way to go. Um, at Church of the Cross, the church plant that I'm involved in, we practice weekly Eucharist. Uh, you're always going to save yourself from a moralistic sermon if you end thoughtfully at the table. And how does this particular passage that you're preaching transition to the table? Uh, so you're always ending on what Christ has done for you, not what you are trying to do for Christ. And I think that that's really powerful. Uh, okay, let's do the seven theses. We've got some time here. Um, good preaching is dependent in every way on the Bible. Uh, I find I, I, I struggle with knowing really how to communicate this to my students effectively that the text really does give you everything. It gives you the tone, it gives you the form, it gives you the structure, it gives it to you. This is the most creative thing you're gonna handle. You don't have to bring so much creativity to it as understand and unlock the creativity that's within it. Right, sir. Right. So find the tension in the text. The division between the human condition and God's redemptive purpose, and the human condition has a lot of complexity to it and a lot of different levels, and you work with that, and you bring out the passion of Christ within that text. It gives you the content, the shape, the style, the tone, the impact. I think good preaching is prophetic, and it's priestly. It's evangelistic, and it's edificational. It's community, and it's individual. We do way too much, for, oh, no, sorry, I, I, I do get opinionated. Um, we get way too individualistic in our preaching. We do need to preach to the body, to the fellowship of believers, to the people of God. The way to get to the individual is through the body not work with the individual to hopefully get to the body. And the Hebrew mind is community first and then the individual. You know, it's not just the person. And this is where I think it opens up a whole new realm of the impact of the Word of God when you're preaching to the church, not just to the person, not in any way to... <laughs> diminish the value of preaching to the person. Um, the first uh, title for this, more than a sermon, was the Rock and Read Challenge. Uh, Lexham didn't like that title, but uh, this is the, the thesis. Jeremiah's statement about the hammer breaking the rock, and preaching needs to do that. And Isaiah's priestly kind of statement, not even bruising the weak reed. The rock and reed challenges. How do you do that? How do you have a priestly word and a prophetic word and put those together in a way that uh, knocks down the Nicodemus but doesn't scare the woman at the well? Uh, you know, and again, the whole the Bible gives you the, the whole thing. I, uh, preach on Nicodemus and the woman at the well in the same sermon. Preach on Mary and Thomas in the same sermon. Because John intended you to see these two 
He's working that drama between the Nicodemus type and in the next chapter, the woman at the well. And at the end, in the resurrection, Mary is approached by Jesus in a very different way than Thomas is. And Jesus meets the needs of both. So there's the drama that's in the scripture that needs to be attended to and tapped into. Good preaching preaches the whole counsel of God. Number two, uh, a lot to, we could say on that. Uh, I like what Dale Bruner says in the second paragraph there. Uh, I love Dale Bruner's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's a two-volume work, but it's really worth it. It, he does what I think a pastoral commentary should do um, because it's kind of the whole thing. It's exegetical, but it's also historical. It's pastoral, and it's also ethical. Um, and it's from years of teaching through Scripture at Hollywood Press in California where he brought all that to, to bear and then does the commentary. Every Old and New Testament text must be brought to kneel before the Messiah. Scripture's center and power before it can be preached as the Word of God. So the whole of Scripture is Christian text. Now I'm just suggesting here that uh, now I'm in a church that follows the lectionary. Uh, I am thankful to preach lectionary texts of Scripture, but I'm also thankful for 30 years of preaching expositionally through the Bible. Because now when I land on a text, there's been a history of trying to uh, explain this whole book. Uh, I'm accepting the, the lectionary thing. That's probably not what I would do personally if I were pastoring a church. Uh, I do think the lectionary is helpful for getting the whole counsel of God. Uh, but as it was intended, it would be intended for the whole congregation to be working through all the lectionary passages through the week, not just on Sunday. But the year divides, see if you find this practical or helpful, the year divides into seven preaching periods. The fall, Advent, winter, Lent, and Easter, Pentecost, spring, and summer. Mentally, that's what I sort of thought through in San Diego. And sort of putting passages together that fit that. Like during Lent, we always took hard passages. We preached through Jeremiah. We did Revelation. We, we did texts that you'd have to really work on. And our particular congregation, for the years I was there, we would take a text like Jeremiah, work through that during the seven Sundays of Lent, but all the small groups just for Lent would change. So they, we'd change from our sort of relational groups to, uh, to groups that were more geographic and more demographically, age-wise anyways, diverse. And then all those leaders, with the Sunday before, would uh, study with a leader, and then they would lead those groups, and then come Sunday. I, I, you realize what it's like to preach to, let's say we'd had 250 in those groups, to preach to 250 people who've read the text, discussed the text, been taught the text, and then they come to church. You know, you know it's usually the other way around. You know, you preach the text, and then they work on it through the week. But in this case, they came primed, and wow, that's a, that's a really wonderful... I don't think you can sustain that all year. It would start to drift off, but you could for Lent. Um, and that worked very effectively. Uh, the bottom of the page, Tim Patrick and Andrew Reed in their book, The Whole Counsel of God, challenge all vocational pastors to set themselves the goal of preaching through the entire Bible over 35 years. Now, I don't know about you, but 
I have already referred to multiple churches that I've been involved in. Very few people stay for 35 years in the same church these days. We're a transient population in many areas. One of the things they also say is that when you've preached that text, you can never preach it again because you're on this 35-year plan. So once you've done Ephesians 1, you're not going to come back to that. Uh, once you've done Psalm 23, really? Once in 35 years you'll do Psalm 23? Uh, so I don't see that as a very workable model because I love re-preaching the same text, and I think a congregation needs that. But we should probably be more creative in how to encompass the whole counsel of God. Uh, the first time I went to Ghana, I didn't know what to do. I had trained, prepared myself for the pastoral epistles. I had preached through the pastoral epistles uh, to be ready to train pastors in northern Ghana. And I got there, and I was feeling I was just way too American in my approach. And uh, through the experience of meeting the tribal linguist in a Muslim tribe, whose responsibility was to tell the oral history of the tribe, I realized I wanted these pastors to be God's tribal linguists. And so we started in Genesis and went to Revelation in a week of intensive teaching, four or five hours a day, uh, and we went from Genesis to Revelation. I knew I needed to do and learn how to do that better, but it was a great experience of taking sort of, okay, you got a week to spend in the Bible and go through the whole of Scripture. Uh, I came back then to, uh, to San Diego and decided that I would... Uh, preach from Genesis to Malachi over an extended period of time with oh, like five sermons on Genesis. Because every biblical book has its own DNA. It has its essence. So in a way, you discover the DNA of the book and then break it out, and you can't cover it verse by verse. Line by line, phrase by phrase. I, I'm really not that inclined for that kind of preaching because I think it flattens the text. But get the essence of it. And, you know, and I felt pretty convicted about this because I had studied theological German. I had studied patristics. I had studied extensive the theology. I knew Latin American liberation theology really well. That was my dissertation. It's Christology. I had studied a lot, but ask me what Zechariah was in the Bible for. I didn't know. Now, that's sad commentary. So there's a portion of the Bible, and it's just right here that I couldn't really give you a reason for, but I could give you Bart, could give you Athanasius. So um, this is our life project and getting the whole, taking in the whole, and communicating out of the whole. The whole counsel of God is, I think, really important. Uh, good preaching, um, number three, well, I don't want to skip. Well, good preaching brings to bear the whole counsel of God in our life situation. I, uh, in addition to the time factor, which I mentioned, I'm probably pretty sensitive as to whether or not pastors are clued in to a kind of situational awareness of what's happening and addressing that from God's Word. Uh, even what's happening in people's lives or what's happening in the culture. Uh, that's why the, in, our, in our church, the, t uh, the pastoral prayer is really the prayers of the people, and we can logistically carry that out where people pray. I, my encouragement uh, to in leading that is no one should leave here wishing that something was prayed for. 
because you now have this opportunity to help us, to lead us in a sentence or two of praying for someone or something. But when it comes to preaching, I do think we need to be more situationally aware. Uh, I have written a paper on a Christian understanding of American politics. You can pick up a copy if you want one. But I find it very challenging to pastor and to preach in this era and not address it. I got to speak to it. First Peter is a wonderful book for addressing our particular situation, I think, of what it means to be resident aliens in our culture. So uh, that's an area that, to me, a pastor needs to work on. Uh, I think when we have a pandemic, I think it's probably pretty important for us to really discuss a Christian view of science and who we're trusting and not overreact. Well, uh, you can see I get along well with everybody. <laughs> Number four, good preaching. On, well, I found this quote from Esau McCau McCauley, uh, who teaches at Wheaton College, um, kind of really important. Um, it's in the context in which I discuss pastoral commentaries. Do you know the difference in pastoral com commentaries between those that stay in the first century and those that bring you into the 21st century? This is Macaulay. I read biblical commentaries that displayed little concern for how biblical texts speak to the experience of black believers. When there was an attempt to provide practical applications to texts, these applications were too often designed for white middle-class Christians. Others decided not to apply the text at all. Instead, scholars simply described the Jewish and Christian world of the first century. To me, it was a sign of privilege to imprison Paul and Jesus in the first century. I go on to say it's easier to live in the biblical world than it is to live biblically in the world. The challenge is how we take God's truth and apply it now live into it, not just feel like, wow, we heard a good sermon. That doesn't help that much. Uh, number four, good preaching understands that God's Word is central to everything pastors are called to do. Now, I love Luther here. Reading him, uh, second line, Martin Luther puts it, the first and foremost of all on which everything else depends is the teaching of the Word of God. For we teach with the Word, we consecrate with the Word, we bind and absolve sins by the Word, we baptize with the Word, we sacrifice with the Word, we judge all things by the Word. Therefore, when we grant the Word to anyone, we cannot deny anything to him pertaining to the exercise of his priesthood. This word is the same for all. As Isaiah says, all your sons shall be taught by the Lord. Luther says, if we are giving the word to people, what can't they do? Because they have the word to do all. Number five, and then we'll just leave you to... Um, read it if you want to, and I'll open it up for some questions. But number five, I, in working on this book, I was interested in exploring what makes preaching hard and what makes preaching easy. And here I quickly outline it just in sentences here. Uh, preaching is challenging spiritually. You see where I'm reading? because we are compelled to live in tension with the fallen human condition and God's redemptive provision. That's not easy. Preaching is provocative intellectually because we embrace a worldview and a meta-narrative that runs contrary to our secular age. 
Preaching is unsettling socially because thinking Christianly challenges the way the world works relationally, sexually, politically, economically, and globally, and probably a few more. Preaching is convicting ethically because Jesus' kingdom ethic calls for conduct that at times runs contrary to the world. Preaching is disconcerting pastorally because it calls for true discernment and leadership in a countercultural household of faith. Preaching is a good kind of hard when we preach the whole counsel of God, when we are committed to preaching the biblical text humbly and honestly, when we are willing to open our hearts, stick out our necks, and preach the truth in love. Preaching's hard because we are fighting on two fronts, the secular front and the religious front. On both fronts, we face the double threat of compromise and conceit. But it's not only hard, it's also easy. Preaching is easy personally because giving one's life for the sake of understanding and proclaiming God's word is preeminently worthwhile, deeply satisfying, and life-saving. You think of the disciples at the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus turned to them and said, you want to go as well. And Peter responded, you have the words of eternal life and we have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Where else do we have to go? Well, that's, that's very satisfying to come to that kind of conclusion. Where else do I have to go? Preaching is easy intellectually because the same eternal word that created the heavens and established the earth is the enduring word that saves us and directs our steps. And that's why historical theology and reading the patristics and reading great theologians is so helpful. Because we're still working with the same material and it's still relevantly, relevantly true. The author of life is one and the same savior of the world. The history of nature and the history of redemption are revelations of the same God. So I can feel a oneness with that, those first century apostles. Preaching is easy socially because the word of God centers the person and the community in Christ. There is no greater relational guide for handling the complexities of life together than God's word. Now, I do think socially for pastors, you're constantly working with expectations that other people have imposed on you or that they have. Um, and I want to relate to people by means of the word and what I am called to do. I mean, I, I can't quite envision the Apostle Paul being interested in your golf game or Saturday night college football. Uh, I think he was a pretty exclusively focused person. Um, and I think some of us, we can be that. We can be that. Um, and people get the message that that's who they are. I, I may be violating sort of some relational taboos right now, but I, I'm sorry. This is who I am. I don't have a lot of hobbies. I don't really feel usually like talking about movies. You know, this is, and that's okay. And by me saying that, I would encourage you uh, perhaps to feel the same. That doesn't mean if, if you love golf, great. Connect with people over golf. If you love the movies and you're always wanting to talk about it, great. Connect with people over that. But it's also okay to be pretty focused. That's okay. We're all different. Preaching is easy ethically because the Lord has shown us what is required of us to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. Oh, and you sort of say, oh, that's not easy. By God's grace, we have the clear moral guidance and empowerment to live in the way God designed us to live. Um, our Heavenly Father really wants what is best for us. And that sacramental cast of life is something that I want to convince young people of, convince uh, the congregation of, that just what God has said in his word for this morality, this moral order, this ethical kingdom ethic, um, 
I want us to see that this is just great. It's what God designed for us. Preaching is easy pastorally because we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, goodness, humility, and gentleness. Bear with one another and forgive whatever sins you have against one another. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word is inspiring. It's guiding. It's directing. Well, we've got 10 minutes or so for Q&A, and you have a lot of what I'm trying to say in this book given for free. This is the only way we can get you to read it is give them away. <laughs> Any questions? Mike, you started with three stories. And the one about we tried too hard and we just let the gospel be. Cool. Do you have any wisdom of how to navigate those things of like, and to a certain degree, illustrating and contextualizing the gospel to the people you're trying to care for, and then also just letting the gospel be the gospel. Yeah. Um, well, as I kind of indicated there, I feel like I learned through trying too hard to sort of impress that I didn't need to put myself or other people under that burden. Um, and I probably over time have loosened up a bit in terms of um, not being so calculated, praying more than calculating um, on this. Uh, I do think, too, your generation, if I can spread that all the way out, your generation. Um, I come from a baby boomer generation that was more wired for the grandiose. Um, I'm admitting this. I mean, <laughs> and I think the, uh, the emphasis now, uh, Beeson students over my tenure have really changed. When I first came, the megachurch was something big, the attractional system, all that kind of stuff was sort of, you know, in your eyesight, the student's eyesight. Now, I think they're looking for reality and relationships and kind of an authenticity. So we really can, in Christ, be ourselves. And I think that works. They're also looking for dialogue, you know, for actually interacting, not just being, lit, you know, talked to. Yeah. You know, you have a rich legacy of years and years and years that you've preached. And you talked about the one pastor who had his 150 sermons. And I'm sure that your repertoire is, you know, is, I mean, what you've preached over the years. But when you rework this, when you do this, to, to what end is that? What do you think about the messages you've preached in terms of the, the legacy of the preaching of the preacher? What, what, do you, what do you do with all these messages that you've preached over the years? And when you think about how would, you said you would not re-preach them, but you rework them. And I'm just wondering... Well, I guess what's first and foremost to me is the biblical text and not my sermon. So it's the biblical text that I keep coming back to, and I come back to it with the wealth of insight, the wealth of relating that text to others. Um, I do think of different contexts that I've preached this, uh, but the text it remains very fresh. Uh, you know, when I was first starting out as a pastor, I thought, what happens when I exhaust everything? <clears throat> you know, like when I have nothing more to preach. Well, now that I'm 72, almost 73, I realize that's <clears throat> never going to happen. There's always going to be more. Um, and I'll never get to the bottom of it. Uh, so, uh, and I think, isn't that a great I mean, and, and that a great vocation to be a part of, yeah. um, that you, do, you never do get to the bottom of it. I don't know, that probably doesn't directly address your question, but um, I guess it's the way of life of always thinking about that text. 
and not restricting your thinking by, well, that's a finished sermon. Um, and part of it is how I deliver sermons, too. Uh, you know, some people will preach like two services, and the sermon will be almost exact. I mean, I have a good friend who preaches very, very well, and it's almost word perfect. I don't know if he has a photographic memory or what, because he doesn't read them, but they're just spot on. I can preach almost a very different sermon. Not same truth, but in a very different sermon in the second service. Uh, and when I've had three services to do, I am, well, one, I'm totally wiped out. But, uh, and then you're, you know, so people just preach differently. Yeah. I like, though, the idea that it's open-ended. Not the truths. I'm not processing new truths, but uh, how you communicate that truth. And I'm very environmentally sensitive, too. I find when I'm with people that really kind of, I'm having to really break the ice, it's very hard for me to preach. Uh, when I'm in a household of faith that I'm very familiar with, I'm familiar with the people, that's much easier for me to preach. And I also like probably a degree of informality rather than, although I've preached from a high pulpit for 14 years, um, this seems like more real to me than for you to be at a great distance and I'm trying to communicate. 